From a defabricated garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA, this is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, the top five reasons you should probably learn to read. <laughs> And now, the podcast host who's got all his reading done well before he hits that porcelain throne, Pete Dominic. All right, Pico, thank you, as always, for every day, taping an original introduction to the show. I love you, man. <laughs> I always look forward to hearing it. I hope listeners do as well. We've gotten used to it and, and expecting of it. Uh, Monday through Thursday, Pete writes those intros, and I just can't wait. I don't know. You never know what he's going to come up with. Yes, get a lot of reading done. And for today's show, I read a very good book, and I'm continuing to read it. It's called Grace, President Obama and 10 Days in the Battle for America. And I will interview the author, the former chief White House speechwriter, President Barack Obama's chief speechwriter, Cody Keenan, joins me today, the week the book comes out. Very, very, very happy to share this interview with you today. Now, normally most days I do a little bit of a news recap on the show, something, just a little bit of commentary here. But like last week with Dahlia Lithwick's Lady Justice, this is the book interview. I want it to be evergreen. I want it to live in the archives for you to go back and listen to or tell people to go listen to. Also, I got home real late because jo uh, Julia's volleyball game went very late on Monday night. So I didn't get together much to comment on and I didn't want to half-ass it for you. So I'm very happy to share my interview c with Cody Keenan because this dude is very cool. I had a great talk with him a couple of weeks ago, actually, when our conversation took place. But I couldn't release it. They didn't want me to release it until the book came out, which is this week. My guest today wrote with President Barack Obama for nearly 14 years, rising from a campaign intern in Chicago to director of speech writing at the White House and Obama's post-presidential collaborator. He's been named the Springsteen of the Obama White House. Obama calls him Hemingway, and British GQ once listed him as one of the 35 coolest men under 38. Cody got his start in public service as a young aide to the legendary Senator Ted Kennedy. Holds a master's degree from Harvard. Did his undergrad at Northwestern in Chicago, where he continues to teach a course on speech writing. And Cody says he got to write his dream speech just four days before Obama left office. One welcoming the world champion Chicago Cubs to the White House. Today, Cody Keenan lives in New York City with his wife and daughter, Gracie, who actually made an appearance. I had to edit it out, but she joined us for for a few moments during the interview. Cute little girl. She's like uh, two years old, I think. His first book, Grace, Barack Obama and 10 Days in the Battle of America is out, available now. You can follow Cody on Twitter at Cody Keenan. This is a big get for me and, and the show, so I'd love it if you tweet him. Like, really go crazy sending tweets. If you never send a tweet to anybody, send one to, to Cody Keenan because he'll be great to have back on the program. And if he knows people is, are listening and I know he enjoyed the interview, he'll come back. At Cody Keenan is the Twitter. The book is Grace. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. There he is, Cody Keenan. Congratulations on this book and on your career. I am so excited to talk to you. Thanks for joining me, man. Thanks, Pete. It's awesome to be with you. Yeah, what a what an interesting life you have had and what an interesting, I mean, an important and fascinating book. But let me just, I guess, start with how you met President Obama. I mean, were you when you were growing up, were you like, I want to be a speechwriter someday, a writer someday? Uh, how, how does that lead to to getting connected with the, the president of the United States? No, speechwriting didn't cross my mind until I think I was 25. Um, you know, I moved to Washington right out of college and got a job in Congress working in Ted Kennedy's mailroom as an unpaid intern, just kind of learning the ropes, gradually worked my way up, started writing a couple speeches for him. And uh, what changed my life is I was on the floor of the convention center in Boston when uh, state Senator Barack Obama gave the speech that made him famous. And a couple years later, I met John Favreau and he hired me as his intern. Uh, that was Obama's first chief speechwriter. And I just kind of hung on for 14 years. So the first speechwriting gig you got was with the president was in the White House. Yeah. Wow. You must. Be, well, you must the campaign. You, well, yeah. the campaign. OK, right. Wow. I mean, it's a pretty it's a pretty amazing gig. You're, so you started when was your first day in the White House, the, the first day of the administration? The first full day, January 21st, 2009. I didn't go to work on Inauguration Day. I mean, can you just tell me what that was like? I mean, I, I know you met your wife that day as well, which is a, another amazing story about your and her life, I guess. But 
What is it like to be in the White House and know that you're working there and for President Barack Obama? It's like equal parts terrifying and amazing and sort of out of body. You know, you, you show up at the White House gates on your first morning and hand them your ID uh, and you just you assume they're going to be like, no, dude, you're not on the list. And then they let you in and you're like, oh, my God. And, you know, it's kind of like the first day of school. You have to check in, go to a bunch of briefings, get a laptop. But you also have to rescue an economy that's on fire. So there was a lot going on and find the bathrooms, you know. That's right. Yeah, you, it, it's always important to be reminded about what was happening at that time, which is a lot of what your book is, is doing. How many people are working on the president's speeches? And is it similar to most presidents that there's this many people, this kind of team? They're all different. I, I know it, at, at one point in the Bush administration, they had 13 speechwriters on payroll. By by the second term, we had eight, two focused on national security, two wrote for the first lady. And then there were four of us that that were kind of all purpose infielders uh, doing everything else. Um, but it, we had this amazing tight knit team that, you know, I still talk to every day. Um, a bunch of us came up in the campaign and you're sort of forged into a family and uh, you get each other's backs and that's how you make it through. You're, how, how do you answer question this next question while appearing to be modest? But it would seem that if you're a speechwriter for anybody, the president, the principal at this point in this example, they take a certain shine to you, a certain liking to you, and they want to work with you. I mean, he came to call on you Hemingway, and there's so many pictures of you with him. You must have been pretty close with him. He must have really favored your work, Cody. Don't be modest. Just tell me how you rose in the ranks to be so in his light. I, uh, I was just too stubborn to leave, really. But I, I worked hard. I made sure it was the workhorse of the team in the first term to try to learn his voice and write as many different speeches as I could. And we had a good rapport. But and, you know, like you said, he he was great. He had my wife and I to the White House on our wedding day with our families and our wedding party. Like, who does that? And we, we're still in touch today. I send him baby pictures all the time of my daughter, Gracie. But it, our relationship was still... You know, I more on my side than his. I was always terrified of giving him a draft. I would work myself, you know, into a panic just trying to get him something he could work with because he was he was a perfectionist and he demanded, you know, something great. But we also knew that if we didn't quite hit the mark, he'd be there to take it to a higher place. We just didn't want him to have to do that. So I still always approached him as my boss, you know, um, as the president of the United States. And it, it, it's sort of at arm's reach just because I, I never wanted to get close enough that he would be personally disappointed if I ever handed him something that wasn't up to stuff. That's interesting. But how do you, how do you separate when it's the president and you're writing speeches for him? I mean, it must be an intimate relationship, no matter what kind of boundaries he or you put up. It is. You know, I, I, I write in the book a lot about our kind of private speech writing sessions, sometimes late at night, you know, the night before the Charleston eulogy, he blew up the back half, just completely deleted what I had written and, you know, we were meeting in the White House close to midnight in the residence to go over it. But there's 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 a big level of trust there between the two of you. I mean, especially for someone like him who is careful with his words, who really cares about what's on the page, sometimes down to the syllable for him to give trust to someone else, not just me, but everyone else on the team to put words on the page for him. You know, that that's a big leap of faith. And so we would work really, really closely, you know, on complicated speeches, we'd sit down a few days in advance, maybe even a week in advance, and we'd hand drafts back and forth and make each other better. But you do get really, really tight just out of necessity. You know, you're, you're getting into someone's head and you're, you're trying to write what he would say if he had the time. So you have to be pretty close. I, I would never say that we were, you know, best buddies, but we'd, we'd rap about the, you know, the bears game last night or whatever. Uh, you are also an expert, and I guess you have to be in political messaging. So whatever you write, how is it going to land with different audiences? How is it going to move your agenda forward? Is it going to be received the way that you, you wanted it to be received? Did you argue with him about those types of things in terms of if, if, you, if I write what you want me to write, people are going to not think what you want them to think? Is that that kind of thing? Were you able to do that? Was that even your place? Yeah, it's, you know, it was it was a lot easier in the second term than in the first mm -hmm. uh, when I was still kind of a junior speechwriter and afraid of him. I would I wouldn't dream of doing that. I made John do it. But by the second term, it was my job. I could I could step up and do it. That didn't mean it was easy. You know, I remember he was going to he gave a speech on the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. I mean, he's he's on the Lincoln Memorial on August 28th, 2013, 50 years to the day after Dr. King stood there. And that's first of all, that's not fair to ask somebody to do a speech like that, you know, it's just, it, it, it will not be as good as the original period. 
But he'd added a line into it. And to this day, I can't remember what it is. I can't find the draft that I just knew it would just, it would just, the Fox News outrage machine would like blast a cartoon horn and it would just be the only thing on the news for like a right. week. Right. And that's sometimes that's part of his point, you know, to get people thinking about something. But I was like, look, this, this will just overshadow everything else you say. And I think that'll be really disappointing. He had this way to, of, he would push back on you a little bit. He would force you to make your case, even though, he, even even if he agreed with you already and knew you were right, he would still force you to make your case. It was a little bit like torture. And then he finally relented and let me take that line out. And he said, uh, he shrugged his shoulders and said, I just think it's sad that, that you don't think we can talk openly and honestly about American history. And then walked out the door and I was like, ah, sucks. That, that you don't think we can, but it's not what, yeah. uh, but it's, but, but you're, you, you were, it sounds to me like I'm in the room and have a point, but like you were, t- we can, it's just that how it will be received. You always had to think about how it was going to be received by Fox, by Hannity, Bill O'Reilly, Rush Limbaugh at the time and how they would re regurgitate that. So it was more about not what you think, but how it would be interpreted by, in this case, right wing media, much less his Republican critics. It, it would seem, am I Correct. Yeah. yeah. He he just said that to twist the knife and make me feel bad about myself. But OK, so so much to talk about in terms of the actual speeches. But I just want to allow you to tell people, I mean, I'm loving this book. I covered the Obama administration for Sirius XM and CNN. I mean, I used to have dreams that I was hanging out with the family because I was so cover i knew every nook and cranny and so to me it's a fascinating read but why now do you put this book out and and why will people want to read it as much as i did even if they didn't cover the obama administration yeah there's there's a thematic reason and a technical reason the technical reason is that i continued to work for president obama for four years after leaving the white house and i just didn't feel right about uh writing a book about him while i was on his payroll so i waited until i started in early 2021 after i left the thematic reason is you know this book is about 10 days in june 2015 where all these extraordinary events happened and you know as you're living through those 10 days you're not thinking okay this is day three you know you don't know what's going to happen you're living through everything in real time with everybody else with no idea what the outcome is going to be. And I didn't, what the meaning of those 10 days didn't really crystallize for me until I, I had some time to think about it. And then the Trump years really crystallized it for me, you know, because we were suddenly living through the backlash. We were living through the opposite, the upside down. And that's when I first thought, you know, there's, there's a story there. And on the, on the second anniversary of, you know, what I now call day 10, I did a little tweet storm summarizing those 10 days because you know, Trump had done something stupid that morning uh, and everybody was up in arms about it. And I just figured, you know, I'm going to tweet out something hopeful and remind people what we're capable of, uh, what we did just two years ago, how people made that possible. And Esquire picked it up and ran a story about it. And that's when I was like, you know what? There might be an audience for this. Oh, God, there is. I mean, what you what you share, what you're able to share uh, is so important, and so relevant. And you also apparently helped President Obama on his book. So you know what he wrote in his book and you know what other other folks who worked with you have, have written about. And I would just say I'm pretty familiar with with much of it. I, I, I eat it all up. And this is so much different and, and so important. I think to me, one of the most important qualities uh, of, of Barack Obama is that he was and is, well, as president, he was this consoler in chief. And unfortunately, there were so many horrific, violent acts of whatever you want to call shootings, terrorism, whatever you want to say, really. But from Tucson to Newtown to obviously Charleston, and you worked on many, if not all of those speeches. Why is it so important that the president is able to give those speeches? And what was how hard was it to, you know, there at, at, once you got to Charleston after all these other shootings and the specific this you know, horror of this one, of course, he even said there's there's no more words. So how do you write a speech, Cody, about a, after a horrific event like that? The you know, when you enter the White House, you don't eulogies are kind of the last thing on your mind. You're thinking yeah. about State of the Union addresses, moonshots, you know, changing the world. You don't think you're going to have to write a bunch of eulogies. Um, and then there's just this, you know, this kind of increasing frequency of mass shootings. Um, there were a whole bunch before Tucson and Tucson in 2011 was kind of the first one that got national attention because a congresswoman was you know, shot in the head while she was doing an event. Gabby Giffords, um, Newtown, you had 20 little kids murdered in their classrooms along with uh, six educators who were trying to protect them. They just kept getting worse and worse. And 
you know, as president, it's, it's your job to be consoler in chief. It's your job to convince people that the world will keep spinning, but, it, but it's also your responsibility to try to get people to change, you know, even if the odds are stacked against you. And after Newtown, um, the president had just been reelected, you know, Newtown was in December, 2012, the inaugural address was coming up and he decided to push his second term agenda a little to the side to do, to try to do something about guns, you know, even though, Democrats had nowhere near 60 votes in the Senate and it was just an uphill battle, but you got to give it a shot. Um, and in uh, April of 2013, Republicans blocked background check legislation. They blocked a vote on it, um, in the Senate gallery while the parents who's of, of those Newtown kids who were murdered sat in the gallery and watched. I to, mean, it to was be clear, just to be clear, they wouldn't even vote on it. Mm hmm. They blocked the vote. I, it, you know, to be totally fair, the 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 bill they were voting on was co-sponsored by a Republican Pat Toomey from Pennsylvania, who's a big time conservative. And there were a couple Democrats who from redder states who joined Republicans to block it. But in the end, 90 percent of Democrats voted to move forward. 90 percent of Republicans decided no. Mm. And that was about as cynical as I've ever seen the president. That was about as angry as I've ever seen the president. You know, he he went out into the Rose Garden and gave this kind of fiery speech that I drafted one that was pretty fiery and he had the parents with him and, and Joe Biden with him. Um, and he didn't even edit it. He, he, he grabbed it from me and he was like, you know, I'll, I'll kind of use this as a template, but I'm going to, I'm just going to go out and say what I want to say. And I was like, hell yeah. Um, but he came back in afterwards and he, you know, he, he doesn't raise his voice often, but he, you know, in the book, I said his words could have cracked the planet in half. He was like, what do I do? The next time this happens, the next time there's a mass shooting like this, what, I just go give another eulogy? What am I supposed to say? We just, well, we tried. We're not going to do anything about this anymore. And he had a point, you know, the, the there's a predictable and there's still a predictable cycle after every mass shooting where, you know, there's kind of this fog of misinformation and then everybody's pointing fingers. And then the president goes and give his, gives a eulogy and we all move on. And, you know, I got a little resentful, which is probably unfair because it's I, 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 I wasn't in any of these massacres, but that you know, we had to absolve the country of our collective sin after every single shooting, you know, and then move on. And so I was with him. I was like, we, why do this anymore? You know, it's, it's sad and it's terrible, but unless America changes, why bother? He had to do it a couple more times because there were mass shootings on military bases in the, over the next year. And as commander in chief, he just have to do that. And, and then Charleston, you know, we had a real debate over those 10 days about whether or not to go do it. He didn't want to for the first half of the week. He, he was adamant against it. Um, why, what those families for the same reason he'd been in, in 2013, you know, what's it going to change? How many more words can we find to describe, uh, a massacre? You know, why do I have to go speaking after each one of these? What's it going to, what, what difference is it going to make? And I, I don't think he truly meant that. And he knew that this one was different. You know, this is a white supremacist going into a black church saying he wanted to start a race war, uh, under the Confederate banner. Um, what really changed things was, Two days after the after the attack, and you know it was really a terror attack. Um, all the families forgave the killer in open court on live television, and it was staggering. I I, I couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't do that. And the president was so taken by it, and I really think it kind of changed the tone in the country just a little bit. You know, it seemed like people were carrying themselves a little bit differently than usual. That could just be because the the massacre was so awful, but so was Newtown. And so, the, you know, the president still hadn't decided on Monday of that week whether he was going to speak. But he, 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 he said, you know what, I want to go down there and I want to hug those families. I don't I still don't want to talk. But if I do, that's what I want to talk about, the concept of grace. And, you know, what I was saying earlier is, you know, the, the, the president, it's his job to go be consular in chief. But he also saw a greater responsibility, which is in a situation like that, you eulogize the victims. You're there to eulogize. But you also have to tell us. We talk about what are our obligations now that those people are gone. You know, what are our responsibilities? How do we change? And you know, with the Charleston speech was was such a complicated high wire act because you're talking about you know guns, obviously, but you're talking about race and racism. You're talking about the Confederate flag. It's just it felt to me like because I just internalized all this stuff as a speechwriter. It felt to me like three different third rails all in the same speech, and they have to braid them together in a typically Obama esque fashion. And it was just this was one of the speeches that was just right at the edge of my outer limits, uh, which is why, you know, he crossed out the last two pages and rewrote them himself. One question I thought of asking you when reading about this is how does a white man write for a black man who's talking to black victims? Oh, yeah. I look, I struggled with this um, for 14 years and I write about this in the book, too. I was I was very aware of my whiteness. 
in the White House, you know, especially writing for the first black president. Yeah. Because it's your job to get into his head as yeah. a speechwriter. Yeah. And, you know, I always say that that the most important quality in a speechwriter beyond being able to string a sentence together is a sense of empathy. You have to understand your audience. You know, you have to be able to walk around in their shoes a little bit. Even if you haven't lived their lives, you have to try to imagine what it's like. But there are limits to that. You know, I've I've even though the president and I are from Chicago, we're we're from totally different worlds in Chicago. You know, I'm a North Sider, he's a South Sider. Right. I'm white, he's black. I've never been profiled. I've never been asked for my ID. I've never had to have the talk with my kids about what you do if a police officer comes, you know, you can imagine all these things, but there, there really are limits to what you can do. But, but fortunately, you know, our chief speechwriter, Barack Obama was a black man who, who had written a book on this, who'd been spending his entire life thinking about this. And he would, he would guide us through what, what he wanted to say. That didn't necessarily make it easier when you're sitting alone at your computer trying to figure out what to get him. But but he was he was always the one who could conduct it. It was never, you know, just a group of white kids giving him, you know, <laughs> here are our thoughts on race, sir. Uh, he was always there to take us somewhere. Tell me more about that Charleston speech. He does end up uh, talking and he even ends up singing. And I think everybody remembers President Barack Obama just breaking into Amazing Grace. And it was the most amazing and perfect moment for such a horrific day and tragedy. It was just amazing. I just rewatched it before I talked to you to get myself back in that place and you can't help but tear up. It was so important and you could tell the way the folks there felt by just watching them, but you didn't have to, you could, you could just feel that. What was, what was that? Dis- when did he decide to sing? He's not the greatest singer. He could hold a tune, but I mean, he Don't knew, and that. apparently his wife knew he's not the best <laughs> singer. He's the president. Maybe this isn't appropriate. He, he decided, I don't know if he decided that morning or the night before, but, but he first told me about it that morning. You know, he'd added the lyrics to amazing grace to the speech the night before in that morning, you know, don't forget we were at the white house and the Supreme court found a right to marriage equality. So you've got these jubilant scenes on the steps of the Supreme court and all over the country. And just, you know, there was this, this great joy infusing the white house. He still knew intimately. And I, I promise you, I did that. We have to go, you know, to a memorial service right after this. So he's, he's giving this speech in the Rose garden and he ad lived a lot that morning too. You could tell he, he, he was really taken by, what had happened and how far America had come on an equal rights issue. And in just a relatively short amount of time compared to others. And he was kind of genuinely proud and moved by the whole thing. You know, there was this joy to the day already. And so literally five minutes after he's done speaking, Marine one lands on the South lawn. We get on board, fly to Andrews. He's still editing the speech in flight. You know, he can just change tracks in his brain like that. And he hands it to me when we landed and stands up, buttons his coat and says, you know, if it feels right, I might sing it. And I was just like, what? You know, OK, I'm not going to argue against that. And, you, you know, you get there and it's basically a black church service on national television, yeah. which is extraordinary by itself. You know, yeah. most people don't typically see that, let alone one that is elevated to uh, an event of national importance. And you can tell right away he's going to sing. You know, you've got women in their Sunday best. Everyone is is kind of shouting along with the eulogy. At one point, the pipe organ jumps in like while he's speaking. I'm like, oh, yeah. And he gets there and he takes this this kind of long pause, 10 or 11 seconds. And, you know, I remember thinking, like, maybe he's not, you know, or, or I'm not sure. Maybe he's just gathering himself first. And But nobody else knows that this is going to happen. And right. then he just breaks into song and people kind of lose their minds, both in the arena and on Twitter, for sure. And I asked him afterwards what the what the pause was all about. And he goes, well, you know, the thing about Amazing Grace. And I was like, I, I don't think so. And he said, well, you got to start low. Because by the time you get to a saved a wretch like me, your voice is going to crack. So I was, I was just trying to, I was trying to make sure that I was going to start low. So of course it was, you know, he was, he was just being a perfectionist. That is pretty smart for someone who is not, you know, a, a well-trained singer. He must know something about, about singing music. I guess he obviously does. What was, what was the hardest speech you had to work on? Newtown, for sure. I mean, how do you eulogize 20 little children? And we we had far less time on that one. We had, it was a 48 hour turnaround between, you know, the massacre in that school and the memorial service in that town. And what do you do? Well, how do you tell a country that 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 is mourning the loss of these little kids that you also have to do something about it? That was by far the worst. This this one's more lighthearted. The, the, it's not really the second worst. But one of the more painful was when the Green Bay Packers uh, came to the White House after winning the Super Bowl. 
Yeah. I actually took that afternoon off work and made one of the other speechwriters write it. I just didn't want to be there. Because you're a Bears fan. Yep. yep. That is... Bears. Have you gotten over that emotional immaturity? <laughs> well, we the 85 Bears ended up coming to the White House to celebrate, and then we had the 2016 Cubs, so, you know, it's it's been papered over. I have gotten over that Im- emotional immaturity only because now I have a 22-month-old uh, that has it all for us. That's what I ha, well, that's what I was going to say, because I used to get I used to get pretty wrapped up in sports, my dad even more so. But I remember when my daughter was really young, probably about your daughter's age now, and, and, and one of my teams lost and I took it out on her like subtly. But I was in a I was in a bad mood and I was like, I can't even believe that a team affected me so much. And I'm not on the team. And I just was <sighs> negative towards my daughter. I was like, I can't I can't do that. But that's a hilarious story that you were just like, I'm out of here. I'm not dealing with the, the, with the Packers. The moment I've had this similar to that this past weekend, I was watching, you know, my college team is Northwestern and I was watching them lose to Duke. And I, I dropped the F bomb and my, my beautiful little daughter who's yeah. just sitting there coloring she a coloring book right turns up. around and repeats it right back to me. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh God, I can't do that anymore. She picked it I, right <laughs> up. Yep. Yeah. Children learn what they live. All of it. That's hilarious. Well, it's sad what's happened to Brett Favre. Moving on. <laughs> it turns out he's a huge asshole. This book covers so much about working there and and during this time take me a little bit more though inside what occurred during those 10 days you mentioned marriage equality talk to me about the president I mean, did he really evolve on it or was that like just something that they put out pro- publicly and he always supported it but but you know i mean people I, if i recall correctly joe biden got quote over his skis they said and and announced uh, support for marriage equality before the president himself did and I, it's always been hard to me for me to believe that that Obama personally really wasn't for marriage equality. Well, good for Joe. You know, that's just Joe being Joe. Yeah, he, he's written about a little bit about this in his memoir, so I think it's safe to get into it. He, I, I think there was a real evolution there, like a lot of people. You know, sure. my own father, who who is, you know, just an incredible guy. People of that generation, like for a long time, you just think it's weird, and then you start meeting gay people, and you realize, no, it's not. Yeah. You know, and remember, remember when I mean. It wasn't that long ago that that gay marriage was weaponized. You know, they Republicans wanted to make it a constitutional amendment to ban it in 2004 just to drive their voters to the polls. And, you know, and I think a lot of Americans had that same evolution because their kids came out, you know, and you realize, like, well, I love my kid. So I think to an extent he had that. And there's also, you know, traditionally, the black community also had a harder time with it. And, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to play sociologist there. He he said this in speeches during the OA campaign. He went into black churches and said, we need to get right on this. So there's a bit of an evolution there. There was a bit of politics to it too, you know, when you're running for reelection. And that was one of the very few times I was I was a little disappointed that we we didn't just come out and do it. If there's one thing I could come do differently, it would be that. Now ultimately he he did in the heat of the re- reelection campaign, but that's that's uh you know thanks to to Joe Biden. What was it like Towards the end of President Obama's second term with that last year, those speeches took a turn when President Obama himself started talking about the threat to democracy around the time Donald Trump announced that he'd be running for for president. I I doubt any of you took him too seriously. I certainly didn't. I'm on the record on CNN saying, listen, folks, there's no way and on the radio over and over that Melania Trump will ever be the first lady. I said it over and over. My daughter's. You know, uh, I lost credibility with them for for sure. And so but yet it seems that you guys still were talking about the concerns uh, about democracy. What was that like that last year? Yeah, it, it's it, I mean, I'll be honest, we you know, we roasted Trump at the 2011 correspondence. Yeah, like, I was there. Was it, I was in the room. I remember that. <laughs> How could you take him seriously? You know, he was he was just a clown and a carnival barker. But as the primaries went on, you could start to see that he had tapped into something. Right. And I, I don't think I still don't think it was because of him. He's just the one who you know created permission structure for this to come to the forefront. Yeah. And the, the president saw that early. You know, I, I still don't know if by January, December 2015, anybody thought Trump would end up winning the nomination. But the president saw the general sentiment coming. And, and he, he told me at the end of 2015, you know, I want to make our final State of the Union address about democracy, the state of our democracy. Everything goes through that theme. And his his commencement addresses aimed at young people were about that. His address at the U.N. General Assembly that year was about that. His Democratic Convention speech and obviously his farewell address when at that point we were all terrified democracy was over. 
he had the foresight to do that, you know, to, to, but, but speeches can only do so much, you know, I wish we could have done more obviously, but, but, you know, they, it was, those were, those were a little dark and unpleasant to write about. Cody, what was it like to work in the white house writing speeches and you, you don't have to know much. I mean, I guess you probably just had to watch the, the West wing, but like, if you know just a little <laughs> bit, you realize that everybody is trying to get their cause, their issue, and most of them are really legitimate and important. Just a line, much less a, a, a paragraph. I mean, you write about this. I mean, people literally tried to bribe you to get you to work this into the speech. That must be really weird. I, I wasn't upset the, the couple times just a mysterious bottle of bourbon would show up on my desk. That didn't necessarily buy you any favors. But but people, yeah, staffers would stake me out at the bathroom or at the at the mess. You know, they would just some would just barge into the office. And, and you can't blame them. You know, everybody works on these causes that they've been working on for 10, 20, 30 years. And they just you just need a mention because that can vitalize an entire cabinet agency for the year or, you know, millions of Americans who care about this. And I get it. Uh, but the job of a speechwriter was to, you know, try not to lose an audience halfway through the speech. So there was always kind of a delicate balance between between the policy people and the fact uh, speechwriters and the speechwriters and the fact checkers. How much did you think about how things would play out in in the media in those speeches that you wrote? Like this is going to, you know, be be big on. I mean, obviously, social media has changed a lot even since you were there. But on TV, on cable news or on social media, was that was that something that you, you had to think about as you wrote these speeches? Because you want people to this has always irked me, uh, but you want people to hear the speech and you want people to listen to it and all the way to the end. That's how you write a thing. Yeah. That's how you perform a thing. You want people to hear it. So there's nothing wrong with putting uh, writing a speech that 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 works that, that that keeps people's attention and then then gets picked up on social media it's the reason why president obama sat down with zach galifianakis uh, on between two ferns cuz it really worked to get young people to sign up for the exchanges on the affordable care act i mean i get why that works well, how much did you think about it I, to an extent, you know, as, as the speechwriter, I would still try to think about the audience first. You know, I, I try to picture heads nodding in the crowd, less so right. what would play on the news and, and, you know, what would blow up on Twitter. Fortunately, we had people to do that. You know, Dan Pfeiffer and David Plouffe were laser focused on stuff like that. You know, David, whereas, you know, David Axelrod early on would mark up a speech like the president would. David Plouffe would just insert one line. And that would usually be the line that was played on cable afterwards. He was great at that. Whereas we just wanted to move people, you know, and, and make people think and make people believe again. And there's a chance, you know, we were never naive enough to think a speech is going to change everybody's minds, but we always approach it as if you could change one or two. And, and you always wanted to write something that would last, that would hold up, that, that wouldn't turn sour by the next week, let alone 10 years later. What did you, what was it like inside the White House after the election of 2016 and Donald Trump w was president. What were those last couple of months and, and weeks like? It was pretty dark, man. Um, we were, you know, I, I was there were a bunch of us in my apartment watching returns come in as things started turning south. You know, Dan Pfeiffer and Ben Rhodes were there mm -hmm. and the, the president called around two thirty in the morning and said, hey, we need to uh, we got to write something here. This is going to be bad. And so, you know, we ended up staying up all night to write this just kind of awful funeral statement and everyone's kind of heads were down in the West Wing. But the day after the election, the president crashed our first meeting in the morning, the senior advisors meeting. And he said, you know what, this this is when it's times like these when you need hope the most. And mm -hmm. you know, the president's never been naive about it. He's he's hope is not a naive thing. Hope is actually pretty tough. You know, you, that's when you need it the most when everything looks dark and it's at their worst. You don't need hope when everything's going great. That's when you have to wield it like a weapon when things are going badly. And I don't want anyone's head around here dragging. You know, we have a job to do. We have to see this out. We got to get the Cubs here before I leave office. That was my addition. But it was, you know, it was dark. And, you know, you're, you're starting to pack up, think about what's next and uh, worried that everything you've worked so hard to do is going to get undone. Yeah, that's what was going to be my next question. Now with, you know, the Trump administration luckily over, how much do you think did get undone that was always the big concern there were huge achievements you know you mentioned we mentioned gay marriage and the affordable care act and and other things as well legislatively obviously most importantly don't get enough credit but the economy bouncing back of course but there it was easy to see those achievements lost with a different supreme court which he got three appointments for after holding up merrick garland i mean what do you think, Cody, was was lost and, and hopefully could be regained or maybe you don't think those achievements were lost? 
Well, you know, speaking literally, the Iran deal has has been lost for now. You yeah. know, you, you had this you had this deal that was actually working, and now Iran's closer than ever to a nuclear weapons. Great right? one, yeah, good point. Uh, Cuba is, is one thing I don't understand what the Biden administration is doing. They have not restored the Obama policy, which bums me out. Obamacare, you know, still here. Thank you, um, thank you for that. And, and I think I think the longer it's around, the safer it is. But but really, anything's up for grabs with the Supreme Court now. That's that's been hijacked by the right and. You know, it's an important point that I, I try to cover in the book, too. Like these just because all these things happened in these 10 days doesn't mean that Barack Obama did them. You know, it's largely a coincidence that they all happened in a 10 day stretch. And marriage equality was a result of 50 years of d- dedicated movement. Obamacare was the result of a 100 year movement for universal health care. And we're still not quite there. It, it takes consistent effort. You know, you look at the Dobbs decision. That's not something that just happened overnight. They conservatives have been working that for, for 50 years. So. You know, because they they just they they turn out and vote no matter what. They just stay at it until they get what they want. So I often tell people, you know, it, even if you're disillusioned or cynical about this or that, just pick your issue. What is it? Even if it's just one issue and just work mercilessly to make progress on that one issue. I just want to ask you one uh, one more thing, which is about this latest speech from President Biden. Depending on who people are, they either thought it was a great speech or thought it was a divisive speech. President Obama was a real unifier. In my mind, he did everything he could to unify people. Uh, The criticism is that Joe Biden came in and said he was going to be a unifier and that he called out MAGA Republicans and 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 has been divisive, that that speech was divisive. Do you agree with that criticism that him using certain rhetoric or certain labels or words is too is too divisive for someone who is supposed to try to unify any president? Well, to his credit, you know, a lot of what he's talking about with you're not going to unify the entire country around anything anymore. You're just not. But and he's been able to get more bipartisan legislation through Congress than Obama ever could. You know, yeah. that's that's one thing. Yeah. When it comes to the speech, though, um, I mean, I, it's not divisive it, to tell the truth, to call things out. You know, if, if there's if there's one side out there that's literally trying to overturn the results of an election, stack state offices with people who are going to do the same thing. You've got the sitting senator. Uh, promising violence in the streets if the party doesn't get its way. I mean, at some point you got to call a spade a spade. I, I think what he could have done is I would have gone with, and this is just a semantic thing. I would have gone with, you know, MAGA politicians rather than MAGA Republicans, because you don't want to pay Republicans with a huge broad brush. My guess is what they were trying to do was, you know, give more middle of the road Republicans a permission structure to, you know, not vote Republican this year. But I think if you just if you just highlight those politicians who are leading all this, who are trying to con everybody, who are ginning up all this stuff, I think it's more effective because everybody hates politicians anyway. But nobody wants to see themselves as part of the problem. So well said. Listen, I really am loving the book. It is so, so good. Congratulations. And I just want to say here at the end. Thanks, man. Thanks for all those speeches on behalf of a whole lot of other people. They meant a lot. I listened. I think every one of them. We used to have to go to the speech. When I was on Sirius XM on the POTUS channel, you had to stop what you're saying. And we, we covered the speech and, and played them. So I listened to probably more than than the vast majority of Americans. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for some 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 great words and for your service. It, it, it meant a lot to me and to so many other people. And it meant a lot to me that you agreed to talk to me about your great new book, too. I appreciate that more than, you know, thank you so much. And as a speechwriter, thank you for playing the speeches in their entirety, man. Well, if it were up to me, I wouldn't have. Though, so don't thank me. I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to keep talking. That was the channel's mandate. Well, yeah, and he could go for an hour at times, yeah, too. So yeah, I, I, wanted, feel you. I wanted to take some calls. And he was like, oh, look, <laughs> listen, we got some more. Uh, we got a couple more things to say. Point number 12. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Cody. Thank you. All right, Cody Keenan, the book is Grace, and that is all I've got for you today. A short one, huh? I'll let you go and do other things today. How about that? Uh, just over a uh, half an hour. That's a, a short episode of Stand Up. I've been trying to usually do about an hour, but... I just didn't get it together on Monday night. Hopefully that's okay with you. And I appreciate your support. I can't get all these great guests without your support. Can't do the show without your subscriptions. If you haven't signed up for a paid subscription, please go to standupwithpete.com right now and subscribe and tell your friends. Also, go check out the YouTube page, youtube.com slash standupwithpete, where each and every day we're posting new clips up for you to watch. And listeners are doing that for me. Maddie Carlson, Tina Winsett, Dr. Dr. Barry Hummel, all mostly working together, looking to bring more people in to help and trying to organize that effort. If you'd like to be on the Stand Up with Pete Dominic Street team, email me, standupwithpete at gmail.com. 
Okay. And speaking to people we love, John Carroll, taking us out as he does every day. I love you guys, and I will talk to you tomorrow where I will have more exciting, brilliant guests, including Michael Cohen, former Boston Globe columnist, and more. So I will talk to you then. Take us away, Johnny. For your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, boy, oh, you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. Where every lost child will finally be found There's only one thing to do before we stand our ground And that's stand up, stand up Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all They had to stand up, they had to stand up They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball Drawing all the plans of the stand up But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws And since they weren't even sent They knew that change was gonna come Before the change could begin They had to stand up Alright, they had to stand up We got to stand up We got to look the devil square in the eye We got to let him know It's his time to go To make it clear when all we hear is a lie See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up All right, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 